Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Cybersecurity Matters podcast. I'm your co-host, Dominic Vogel, and joining me as always is the International Man of Mystery, Christian Redshaw. Christian, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I think you've got me mixed up with someone else. No, I, think I, you, I don't think you're I thinking do. I'm Austin no. Powers. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing well. Uh, but uh, on the international tag, uh, we do have someone coming, uh, joining us today from the UK. On the British front. On the British front. Uh, uh, Kevin Evans uh, works with Microsoft as an a- Azure security engineer. I think it'll be a really interesting conversation. Um, been a while since we've had someone from, from the UK on the show. Uh, so um, we'll take a brief momentary pause and we'll bring Kevin aboard. Sounds good. Let's do it. Kevin, my friend, thank you so much for joining us on the Cybersecurity Matters podcast. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing doing amazing today. Really, really good day for me. That's fantastic. I'm happy to hear that. Um, before we uh, uh, get started, um, I do want to ask, um, and not to take that question away from you, but I'm going to anyway, um, was um, you, know, you, you, you work at, with Azure Secure, so that's you know, Microsoft's cloud. Um, Hijack my question. Yeah, that's I'm, fine. That's the type of person that I am. Um, who, what, what, what does that actually entail? Like, and for technical people, I think they might understand that. But for some non-technical person who hears that, how would you describe what your job entails? So yeah, um, so my role at Microsoft is I'm what they call a customer engineer, and it's a technical advisor role. So it's like a technical leadership role as well. Um, it's a mixture of. Um, being a technical engineer, obviously knowing how the nuts and bolts work, but also doing that sort of architecture level as well, right? And understanding where the customer and the organization needs to go, right? So th- there's different domains that fall into that and security being one of them, right? It's how do I secure my workloads, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna move through a whole bunch of questions, Kevin, really quickly here. Number one, cloud security. Shared responsibility. What does that mean? If our stuff's in the cloud, it's secure, right? Uh, no. So it's shared responsibility model, right? There's a scale to this, right? And it all depends on the level of reliance or the level of commitment, yeah, or the type of workload that you're deploying into the cloud. You still got to, you know, c- configure and secure your workloads in the right way, be that your email or your website, yeah, or, or your databases, right, that are running in the cloud. It's just that because you've chosen a provider such as Microsoft, it means it's secure, right? It is secure from a um, compliancy point of view, right? When we talk about the data centers compliant, right? And that's secure. Like we take care of all of that kind of good stuff. But actually, if you're setting, you know, the wrong kind of usernames, the wrong kind of authentication, yeah, you're exposing those resources onto the internet, then that's that's your responsibility. So you've got to take that into the correct mindset of securing that properly. I have a bunch more questions. Keep asking. Hijack Keep asking. Okay, yes. so Kevin, we're going to <laughs> we're going to milk you and wring out some information from you here. Um, cybersecurity basics. Uh, how would you suggest that a company that uh, is not doing much or is immature? How would you suggest they get started? I think they should start off with the most basic basic of things, right? And that is um, creating an asset list of their their workloads, right, or their services. What is it my business is using, right? That could be from sharing files with colleagues across across the country or across you know across the nation or globally, or that could be I'm serving data to a to to end users across across an organization. So ascertaining what you're what you actually got right is the first step of well how do I handle this right? What does the bigger picture look like? And then you can tackle those those workloads and those assets in a particular order depending on the sensitivity or the compliancy restrictions that you may have applied, you know, you need to, uh, um, you need to sort of comply with as part of part of legal, legal recommendations, etc. Yeah, perfect. So start with understanding what you yeah, have. Yeah, and take take an inventory, make a list. Okay, my final question before I throw it back to Dom here: um, secure software development. So my uh, application works really well from a functionality standpoint, right? That's all we need to know, right? Or, or what? What are the what are the other elements from a security perspective that we need to think about when we're developing or having uh, an application uh, developed for us? So you've got to split that up into layers, right? So when we start off with an application, we've got the design, yeah, or we've got the idea. How's that going to look like, right? 
then we're going to figure out, you know, the code base that it's running on. So what kind of code am I, you know, developing with? Then it's the tools we're going to be using to develop that, right? So that'd be our IDE, right? And for folks that don't know what our IDE is, basically it's applications such as Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio, right? Is using as a code editor, right? So you can um, obviously include plugins to basically scan your code for vulnerabilities at that stage, right? Before we've even committed our code to a code repository. And when I talk about code repositories, I'm talking like Azure DevOps or GitHub, right? Which is a very popular service for hosting code. And then there's controls around that, right? So you can put gates in place uh, as part of the process for your code to be released and that can scan for vulnerabilities, but also make sure that your repos are private, right? Public repos are great, yeah, for advocating and showing open source software, right? This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm capable of. A lot of developers use it out there as basically as a resume, right? To get to get a new role, right? Or look for work, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's to show your abilities, right? And it, sh it should be used that way. But if I'm, a, I'm actual, um, I'm a corporation or a company, then make sure those repos are basically locked down and secured in a certain way that it's private to me because it's intellectual property, even at the code level. Hmm, very good. Kevin, you know, uh, and really intrigued to, hit, to hear your thoughts on this. I mean, um, given everything that's transpired with the invasion in, in the Ukraine, um, you know, that's obviously apart from the, you know, humanitarian crisis has kicked off concerns around, around cyber co concerns or increased cyber attacks uh, for organizations, um, you know, particularly in, you know, in Western Europe and, and uh, North America. Um, do you have recommendations or thoughts in terms of what organizations can do in terms of improving their cloud security, given everything that's transpired recently? Yeah. So as we know, everything seems to be kicking off and, you know, my heart goes out to the people of Ukraine at the moment, obviously, but we're entering a new era of, and, you know, we've, we've all grown up with the stories, right? Of the cold war and everything else. Yeah. Through, through, from the, through the fifties, sixties and seventies and eighties to early nineties. But now the wars aren't just fought on the battlefield, they're fought, you know, in cyber, you know, cyberspace as well, right? And Russia is very well acknowledged and known for state-sponsored attacks. So, you know, my, my first recommendation for any organization is, especially in the Western nations, you know, they're going to come back, right? We've, we've applied all sorts of sanctions and they're going to come back for, you know, retribution, basically. So we're seeing a lot of attacks on our end what's happening and surfacing. But so with, with that in mind, I have got some recommendations based that you could check, right? Or go away and have a look at your architecture. And when we talk about architecture, it could be your software architecture or it could be your, your infrastructure architecture, obviously, which, you know, your workload is being, you know, run on. So the first thing, yeah, is quite simple. A lot of people do this at home anyway. You sign into your email. What's the first thing that you get like pop up with? Enable MFA, multi-factor authentication, right? Get that on your phone, get an app, get that installed, get the, the verification method, methods enabled, right? So take a look at that. Second one is if, you, if you're an organization of a certain size or even if you know, you've only got five to 10 people in an organization, you know, apply apply least privileged access to your uh, user account list, right? Go out, like I was saying before, doing an audit. Yeah, we did an audit on our assets, do an audit on your accounts, right? See who's got what access, do they need access to that and apply the rule of least privilege to, you know, how they access your environment or particular workloads. Um, again, review, review all authentication activity for remote access for infrastructure. So, you know, you've got users that are coming in, be that, you know, for a virtual desktop environment or, you know, the remote desktop in into a situation of a VPN. Um, check the authentication methods with that. Again, technology's moved on a lot, right? So when I talk about, you know, uh, MFA and, and bits and pieces like that, right? And we'll talk about, you know, conditional access. A modern identity provider is an, is an absolute must these days, right? So... You know, we look at Azure AD, right? That has all the roles and services of a modern identity provider, which can, you know, apply all these security layers, right? We're not talking your traditional, you know, Kerberos authentication, right? And the folks that don't know what Kerberos is, I'm talking the days of like Windows AD and that kind of thing, right? 
So, I mean, Windows AD is a stalwart, but obviously moving to a modern identity provider such as Azure AD, it's going to add that security wrapper and those layers to your authentication methods. You know, um, another thing, keep your systems patching up to date, right? The amount of times that I see, you know, uh, um, infrastructure, uh, Infrastructure as a service assets, and I'm going to talk about infrastructure as a service. I'm talking about you know just normal servers that haven't been patched for months, right? That haven't had those latest hot fix applied to them, right? So they're out of sync and they're out of loop. Get them patched. Get a get a regime in place, right? You know you can automate that quite easily these days with a lot of tools in the cloud. You know leverage those tools. You know it's there's gone gone are the days you've got someone running around installing patches and waiting till two o'clock in the morning to make sure the server comes up right you can automate all this stuff you know so again another one to look at is enable logging for key functions right you got a sensitive area you got a finance database get the login turned on right who's accessing the database the you know who's who's referencing certain you know tables when you realize that you've had uh, an attack or the rot set in from an, uh, you know, from a, an attack actor, every piece of information you've got, right, and when you bring in a partner or another security team, right, to come and help you piece the, you know, piece the puzzle together, the more information you've got, the easier it is to isolate that, right, and then target that to secure that workload and limit it, limit limit the damage basically, right, because you've got you know stuff like reputation on the line or you know, heaven forbid, customer data that can be lost, right? So get as much login, make sure that login is secured in a secure location as well. Verify your cyber incident response plan, right? So again, most people start to run around when stuff bad goes happen, you know, get, get those drills in place, right? You know, there's no point, you know, get things prepared. What do I do, you know? So when the situation does arise, you know, you're doing it in a, hopefully in a calm collective manner, you know, because you just want to get this problem solved. Yeah. So having a plan in place, right. Will help your business continue moving as well. Right. So that's important. And one of the biggest ones, and I see this still to this day, even though it's built into most operating systems is use anti-malware software, right? Literally people turn it off. They think it's a performance issue, you know, or I have to pay for it. Literally, you get it built into the operating system these days, right? Use it. You know, it's enterprise grade. Just, you know, make sure that you're protected. And again, the last and final, which is a bit more in depth, and we talk about zero trust. And what I mean by that is, you, you know, most customers are either in the cloud or on-premise, right? So they have a data center or a server that's on-premise, but they're thinking about going to the cloud, right? And they're in a certain part of their journey. Um, and they'll normally have like a VPN link, or if they're a bit more, if they're a bit bigger as an organization, then they'll have Express Route. Um, you know, just because my on premise can access my cloud doesn't mean it's secure, right? And vice versa. So make sure you secure both ends of the gates, right? Trust, trust no one, basically. Even if it's at the end of end of a, a network, right? On the same hub, right? It should be, you know, interrogated investigated that kind of thing regardless so get yourself a firewall basically get yourself a network virtual appliance uh, no no and the last bit was yeah get get yourself a seam right and you know if you if you've got that kind of capacity right in your organization getting lot again when we talk about logs and auditing so you know so cyber security uh, uh, experts can come in and review that data so like i said the more pieces of the puzzle you've got the more information the quicker you are going to be able to resolve that security incident so good so you've just given such valuable insights such um such good advice and that's what's worth a company's money is to get that uh, that leadership that strategic leadership and these are the best practices that they need to be doing but i am concerned that the business leaders that are listening might not understand what kind of value you've just delivered there. You know, all of these best practices, you know, having an incident response plan and testing it, you know, having a SIM multi-factor authentication, all of these, all of these things are so awesome and so effective. But my question, my question is, and it's the title of, you know, the show, Cybersecurity Matters, the, the question of why behind all of these things, 
for for an organization that hasn't actually moved forward with this, or maybe they glaze over when they when they hear it because they're just thinking technology and IT. I'm not inclined that way. I'll leave that to IT, and I'm going to move on with my life. And you know what what drives me and what gets me going in the morning. I want to get market share. You know, I want to I want to move forward and I want to grow our organization and become better. Um, why does cybersecurity even matter in the first place? And and why does it make a company better? before we even get into that. So, I mean, if we're talking from like a leadership point of view, right? Again, it's like paying for an insurance policy, right? That may never come, yeah? That, that's the most, you know, most people's opinions and, you know, inside leadership organizations. But I would argue it's just, it's just as important as your reputation, yeah? Like you want to get to market, right? But you also want to be seen as trustworthy and delivering a product, right? That people can see value in. Um, again, it's as important as where, where, where you're storing the company cash kind of thing right you make sure you choose the right bank right to, to host your your business assets and everything else again same with cyber security right and yeah again like you know they'll they'll speak to it but actually getting a partner in if you haven't got the functionality in your it department making you the more the more opinions you've got and the more information that's presented to you you can make an informed decision off the back of that right so that's what's delivering value You'd go and speak to a banker, right, to, to to understand where your money's going and what's happening with that. Again, you'd do the same with cybersecurity. Kevin, this, this has been just such a really engaging conversation, and I, I, I really appreciate how you broke down those best practices or things that uh, companies and organizations could look at. And given what's happened uh, happening geopolitically, and you know the questions that that's raising at the cyber level, um, always knowing what to do or to look for. I mean, I think that you. you be probably terrific actionable guidance there and uh, i know our, our our listeners and viewers are going to really appreciate that information because that's stuff that they can bring back to their uh, uh it teams uh, whether they're in-house or, or as a service provider right and and make sure that those things are are in place but we're very grateful for you carving out time uh, to chat with us uh, today especially so late in in your evening um but thank you again so much that was a fantastic conversation absolutely no oh, thanks for having me thanks so much kevin thanks that was a blast. Uh, Krish and I will be right back to wrap up today's episode. That was a really interesting conversation with Kevin. You know, um, I really appreciated his insights there, uh, especially trying to bring it home for viewers and listeners in terms of, you know, given what everything that's going on in, in the Ukraine, whether or not they should be taking measures at their own organization. So I do appreciate Kevin laying out a, a fairly um, lengthy, but at least practical <laughs> list of things that, that people can can do at their organization. Um, what, what, what was uh, some of your key uh, takeaways? Yeah, I agree with you, Dom. The nice list of actionable guidance, which we will include in the description or link it out somehow uh, to you uh, off off camera. Kevin uh, pledged that he would do that. So that sounds good to me. Uh, I think the, the main thing for me was the, always the question around why does cybersecurity matter? And so the answer for him was trust, trust for your clients, your customers, um, you know, your shareholders, all of your stakeholders. It's, it comes down to establishing and preserving that digital trust. Absolutely. And we, we're uh, very grateful for, for Kevin for being on the show today and on that same concept of trust. We appreciate the trust that our loyal listeners and, and viewers put in us each and every week by uh, joining us. Uh, special thanks to each and every one of you. Uh, if you have missed an episode, please do check out previous episodes on the Cybersecurity Matters YouTube page and or on your favorite podcasting platform. Uh, until next time, be well, be safe, and we'll see you again on the Cybersecurity Matters podcast. See you next week.